seller, the seller just says, no, we're not closing. Anybody have any idea what that's called? I'll take hands this time. What have they done to your contract? Yes. Sorry? Made it void? Well, um, in that scenario, you would have remedies because the other per as the buyer, because the other person has breached your contract or defaulted, or if there's a notice period for a default before it ripens into an event of default for which you can exercise remedies, you've got an event of default. So uh, when somebody doesn't perform under your real estate contract, it's called breach, default, or event of default. Um, and so in the um, uh, arena of purchase and sales, the example that I was just given, giving you would have an event of default because the seller didn't convey the property to you and you would be able to sue for what's called specific performance, which we'll get to in a second. So uh, any idea you've got a default or an event of default under your real estate contract. Now, what are your two main ways that you would enforce your real estate contract? Any ideas? All right, uh, back corner, have a call on you. No idea? Okay, gentlemen, just join us. Okay, what are you seeking damages? Damages, that's good. That's one way to recover. Uh, what were you going to say? I was going to say specific performance. Yes, specific performance, which I mentioned. And those are the two main ways. And there's a lot of different types of damages, right? You can have monetary damages. You could have punitive damages. Now, in real estate, most of the time, if you've written your contract correctly, everybody's waiving the ability to claim punitive damages. Does everybody know what punitive damages are? It's like punish, punishment, right? It's... Uh, you are collecting more than what the damages that you suffered in order to uh, deter future behavior on uh, the part of uh, the person who breached the contract. So almost everybody waives punitive damages unless you're actually sued by somebody outside of the contract for them. Um, there's consequential damages, which include like loss in value of your real estate or uh, lost profits. Um, and then there's specific performance. And so for specific performance, you need to have the party that you're seeking specific performance from to be party to your contract. Then you can sue them on the contract for their breach and tell them and go to the court and say, these guys have to perform, these ladies, whatever. These people need to perform, right? And that's called specific performance. These people need to convey the property to me because I've obeyed all the all of the covenants in the uh, purchase and sale agreement, and they're supposed to convey the property to me. That's specific performance. Um, so, does that anybody own real estate in the in the class? If you do, okay. So eventually, hopefully, you will own real estate or lease real estate. But in any event, how do you know if you're buying a property, who has rights in the property that you're about to buy or you're about to lease? Any idea how you, you find out if like somebody has a purchase option on the property or somebody has an easement? I'll give you an example. Uh, my neighbor, um, I own their backyard, right? But I found out that they have an easement over their, over that area, so I can't use it. So it becomes their backyard, basically. And how did I find out that they had an easement over that piece of property? Any ideas? Yes. Yes, title. And who keeps title in, say, Los Angeles? Yes. The county records, yes. So there are a number of title companies. Uh, the biggest in commercial real estate are First American, Chicago Title, and uh, Fidelity. And those title companies, you can contact any one of them. And if you have a, an address, they can look up title for you for that address or that APN, assessor's parcel number. That's for property tax purposes. So you give uh, a title company enough clues, then they can go to the county recorder's office 
and pull all the documents that are recorded against the property that you want you are looking into. And so that's part of diligencing a real estate investment is you need to read what's on title to understand if somebody else has rights on the in in the property that you're about to lease or buy um, or build something on. I, it's obviously very important. There could be all kinds of things on title that um, that can mess up your investment. All right, so the county's uh, official records, you've got uh, oftentimes if there's an important lease on the property, there will be a memo of lease um, or a memo of a license agreement. Um, and when you buy property or you lend money to somebody for buying property, you get title insurance. So there's owner's title policies and there's lender's title policies. So I deal a lot with lender's title policies, but also owner's title policies. And um, the title insurance company is essentially um, giving you a claim against them in case you buy the property or lend against the property and your rights, there's somebody pops up and challenges your claim to title to the property. Now it's a little bit more complicated than that and it's insurance, right? You've all dealt with insurance before at some point, right? Okay, so it's obviously more complicated. There are exclusions, there's all kinds of language in a title insurance policy that tries to limit the amount that you can recover or the circumstances under which you can recover. Okay, so that's title and title insurance and very broad strokes. You could, you, we could do three hours on title insurance. So, what are the types of interests in real property? Uh, we'll start from, no, uh, we'll start from the back. Yes. Do you have any idea that those two were not in class? So uh, do you have any idea what kind of interests you could have in real property? Do you know the legal term for ownership, what we all think of as ownership in, in real property? Anybody? Yes. Be simple. Be simple. Very good. Have you taken a law school class? Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. So uh, be simple ownership is what you would think of as owning property. Um, any ideas what other interests you could have in property? Uh, in the back? No? Yes. You have a purchase option. You could have an option. Yes. And what's the best way to protect your option? Uh, would it be, this is just based on what I have yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah. Would it be to, tie, to have a second contract and they both reference each other? Okay. That's one way. But ideally, if you have a purchase option on a property, you want to record that purchase option, right? So then nobody can take title after you that's not subject to your purchase option, okay? Assuming that you've got successors and assigns language in the option. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at this. Fee ownership, thank you very much. Uh, option, very good. Leasehold, that's the most common, like when you're dealing with walking around in a city, almost everything you see is leasehold interest. Our firm, leases space in an office building uh, in downtown. The stores in the uh, town center, they all lease their space. Um, so leasing um, in, in offices, retail is probably the most common, apartments obviously, it's probably the most common form of uh, ownership in the United States right now. Then easement. You could have, like I explained with my house, right? My neighbor has an easement over their own backyard, which actually I own. But the, an easement can be uh, worded such that the, uh, the property that benefits from the easement um, has basically exclusive control over the, uh, the property that they have an easement over. Uh, so it can be very broad and almost resemble ownership. But more commonly, easements are done for things like access to a property, right? If you go to a hotel and there's like a shopping center over here and there's a hotel over here and there's a, maybe like a, a, a drive-through Starbucks over here, 
and they all funnel in through one ingress egress. Typically, there would be a, a CCNR, uh, which is a covenant conditions and restrictions, which contain easements for people to use that access to three different uses to use that uh, ingress egress for the property. Um, there's restrictive covenants. These are uh, covenants that say, uh, okay, I own the neighboring property. You on your property agree that you're not going to uh, open up a, a marijuana shop, for instance, right? So you can restrict the uses uh, or restrict um, how uh, another parcel uh, uses their property. But of course, that other parcel has to agree to it. So they have to sign it. Then there's condominium uh, or condominium association uh, ownership. And that um, it can be risky if you're a construction lender. It brought down a whole bank, chorus bank in 2008. Um, so that's it for the basics. We're going to skip over fund formation. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. If you are ever interested in starting a real estate fund, uh, please email me. I think my email is on my contact, or you can look me up on the web, and I'll put you in contact with Mark, who formed uh, 3650 REITs uh, funds and uh, has a term, like he's an incredible resource. But we're going to go on to purchase and sales. This is Kevin Wilkins coming up. Which one for you? Oh, great. It's like coming every day. I'm going to run. First of all, thanks for having me. My name is Kevin. Um, I'm an associate at Mayor Brown. I work with Dan. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about purchase and sale agreements today, which I think, um, does anybody own any real estate in here? Do their parents own real estate? Covered, no. Covered? Maybe parents, but no. Okay. All right. So say one day you want to own real estate or you happen to somehow get a piece of real estate, right? First thing that typically happens is you're, you're either, if you're looking for real estate, you're you find people that have real estate and you say, I want to buy your property, right? And then if you're a seller, you're looking for buyers. Sometimes you reach out to a broker, broker puts you in contact with the buyer. You guys get a deal basically in place. That deal would be memorialized in an LOI, which is just a basic understanding of simple stuff like purchase and sale, you know, how long you have to close, due diligence, et cetera. When you get that agreement in place, you move on to the purchase and sale agreement, which is what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Purchase and sale agreement basically governs. Use the screen to make slides. Right. Oh, okay. Just use the arrows. Right. There you go. There we go. All right. So, purchase and sale agreement basically just governs the relationship between a buyer and seller between the signing of the purchase and sale agreement and the closing of the purchase and sale transaction, which is uh, you know, when the property is actually transferred from a seller to a buyer. Um, and then sometimes for periods of time after that. So basically the, the first thing that we're going to touch on here is the parties. So we've got a buyer and we've got a seller. The buyer wants in a purchase and sale agreement, they're trying to get as much time as possible to actually review the property, due diligence on the property, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and they, they just want to make sure that they understand the property and what they're getting prior to purchasing it. A seller, on the other hand, really just wants your money and they want to be not liable for anything that happens after your closing. So those are the two pushes and pulls that are going on in the PSA. The property, Dan discussed a lot of it. I won't go over sort of the details in, in too much depth, but like we talked about, there's different types of ownership you can have. There's fee simple, there's leasehold, uh, there's condominium ownership. Each has its different pitfalls and, and things you need to consider. Uh, deposit and purchase price. We'll talk about just sort of the way that money typically works in a purchase and sale deal. Uh, typically you have to put up a deposit. That deposit either uh, gets returned to you if you cancel for certain reasons or you lose it if you act in a bad way. Um, so 
we'll touch on that. The purchase price is pretty obvious. Due diligence, this is kind of a critical role for the, the legal piece of a PSA, uh, both negotiating sort of the access rights and the rights to review certain things on the property and also the actual understanding of what is going on at the property to help a business person or help you know yourself figure out whether or not this purchase is right for you. Uh, reps and warranties are just basically seller tells you certain things about the property. This gets heavily negotiated in a PSA and that likewise is a lawyer's role to discuss sort of what, what things have to be disclosed and there's a lot of negotiations that goes into that. And we'll talk about that. Closing and conditions, we'll touch briefly on the mechanics of closing and what needs to be accomplished before closing and then remedies uh, just talking about what happens when people do bad things. So we'll go through all that. Oops, skip over one. All right, so Dan talked about this a little bit. So the property, you got to consider this when you're drafting the PSA or you're thinking about actually purchasing property. What am I buying? Fee simple condo leasehold. We talked about fee simple. That's, you know, kind of the best ownership you can have. What you typically think about when you're talking about uh, owning a house outright, leasehold is probably what a lot of you guys do where you, you know, lease an apartment or whatever. And condo is obviously you own a portion of a property, you're subject to an HOA or an association, you've got to pay for common areas, et cetera. So I think we've all covered on that. Uh, the other aspects of the property that you're buying, improvements. So not only are you buying the building itself, the land underneath it, but you're buying things that are built into the wall, like, you know, the oven, the refrigerator, washer and dryer, or, you know, in an office, certain other office related uh, fixtures. And then um, you also purchase, if you're buying like an office building or an industrial building, you're also purchasing leases. You know, you become the landlord under certain leases and you have a relationship with tenants. And then you're also purchasing the service contracts, like maintenance contracts, uh, security contracts, whatever contracts affect the property. Uh, tangible personal property, which is you know furniture, artwork, gym equipment, uh, that stuff can be thrown in and has certain value that uh, you want to consider when you're drafting a PSA. And then intangible personal property, uh, trade names, you know like uh, Crypto.com Arena. Staple Center, all that stuff. You purchase that when you purchase property, books and records, just the books of how the property was run, how much money came in, licenses, permits, websites, et cetera. And then warranties, you know, if you buy a property with a roof, it has a warranty connected to it. If there's something that goes wrong, you wanna be able to sue the person that built the roof. So all those things transfer over. And in addition, you know, you also, take on the obligations of the property. So not only do you get all the benefits, but you get the zoning requirements of the property. You know, you, you may buy a property that's used for multifamily. You can't just suddenly turn that into an office, right? It's subject to certain requirements. It's subject to certain obligations. And as Dan discussed, easements as well, right? You buy a property just because you didn't know about an easement, if it's recorded on title, it still affects your property and people still have rights to use your property no matter what. So those are things to consider. All right, so the deposit. So, all right, uh, typically a deposit is about 10 to 20% of the purchase price. And that's usually put in at the time of signing of the PSA. In the residential context, like when you guys go and buy houses in the future, you're gonna put in probably about a 3% deposit when you sign your PSA. And then you put in about a 10% deposit when you go hard, which is basically saying that you're ready to go buy the property. That's how the residential context works. Commercial office, a little bit different. You put the kind of your entire deposit in up front. And then um, after, after you complete your due diligence, you do what's you provide what's called an approval notice. When you provide your approval notice, you're saying, I approve of the due diligence of this property. I approve of it. There's nothing wrong with it. And I'm ready to buy it. At that point, you can't just say, okay, I want to walk away from this deal because you, you have now committed to saying, 
I'm going to buy this property. Before you deliver your approval notice, you can cancel pretty much at any time for whatever reason and get your money back. That's just the way that purchase and sale agreements work. So would you be able to pull out of the deal? It's just the seller will get to keep your deposit or no, will they be able to sue you to actually close? No. So I was I'm getting to the remedies later, but uh, a purchase, so a seller typically, sometimes it can get negotiated, but typically a seller does not have the remedy of specific performance. They cannot force you to buy a property. If you do give your approval notice, right, you say you approve the property, you approve due diligence, and you decide to walk away from the deal, you lose your deposit. So your 10% deal. There you go. Um, we talked about that release to seller. Uh, sometimes a seller will ask you to release their depo the deposit to them. Uh, typically, the deposit is held in an escrow. So Dan talked about a couple of escrow companies earlier, First American, Chicago Title. You get them involved early in the deal, and you have them set up what's called an escrow account. Money goes into the escrow, right? your deposit, your purchase price. And at the end of the deal, the deed and the conveyance documents also go into the escrow. When you're ready to close, money goes to seller, conveyance documents go to uh, the recorder, the deed gets recorded, property gets conveyed. So uh, they handle the money as well, but sometimes the seller will say, actually, I wanna hold on to the money. Um, that's rare, but it does happen. Uh, purchase price, I think that's pretty straightforward. It's just the amount that you wanna buy a property for. And credits is, you know, uh, at the end of the deal, after you do your due diligence and you negotiate, sometimes you'll say, okay, I want $100,000 off the purchase price, right? And you'll negotiate that up until the due diligence period. So that's that. Um, due diligence basics. So like I said, this is a big role for the attorney here to get involved. Uh, one of the big things is talking about in the PSA, your access rights. A buyer will want as much access as possible. They'll want to be able to look at the property, look at all the contracts, look at anything that's material to the property. A seller will want to limit access as much as possible, shorten the due diligence period, make it only 15 days. What's typical is a 30-day period from signing to really do all of your due diligence and get in there and look at everything and talk to tenants and uh, figure out whether or not uh, the property is right for your business purpose. So uh, one of the major things is access to the property. You want to physically go on site, make sure it looks, you know, when you get in there, there's no mold, there's no like lights hanging from the ceiling or whatever. There's not a squatter in the property, things like that. You want to make sure that that's all going on. Uh, you also want to, if it's like a commercial building that has an office, uh, office tenants, you want to interview the tenants and make sure that they're happy there, that they're not claiming that there's a problem with their lease, that they're getting, you know, whatever utility services they need, et cetera. So you want to make sure that that's uh, fine and you talk to all the tenants. You also want to do a physical inspection of the property. Like I said, you want to check the improvements. You want to do an environmental inspection, so you'll hire a third party like environmental specialists to look and see sort of what is the environmental history of the property? Was it used as a farm in the past? Was it used for storage of uh, a gas tank? You know, things like that you need to consider because environmental issues can be hugely costly to somebody developing a property. Uh, there are requirements in California and throughout the country that um, if you develop a piece of property, uh, you know, so you develop something for residential, there can't be a certain amount of contaminants in the, in the ground. So you can't, you know, until you clean that up, you cannot build an apartment complex or an office complex. So those are things that you need to consider. Um, additionally, legal condition of the property, title and survey. So say, you know, you buy an office, right? And you're thinking, okay, I'm going to flip it to industrial. I want it to be an industrial property. This is the way that things are going, Amazon, fulfillment center, whatever. That's fine, but 
you need to make sure that your zoning permits that, right? You can't just do whatever you want with property. You have to actually make sure that you're legally able to do it. So during your due diligence period, you need to look and see, okay, can I do this? If I can't do this, what do I have to do to get it done? And then you have to either change the pricing of the deal to make it work for you, or uh, you know, make it a condition to closing that you get that entitlement or that approval to change it to an industrial property. Permits, you know, you just want to make sure that you have all the permits that you need to operate the property as you plan on operating it. Certificates of occupancy, you just want to make sure that you can occupy the building and that it's not any issues with occupancy. Um, we'll, we'll skip over a little bit of prior objection rights. Um, so I, I think Dan talked about this a little bit, but you know, when you go and you buy a property, you're going to get a title report, which is basically a report of all of the issues that are on title, or all of the, I shouldn't say issues, some of the stuff is an issue, but everything that is on title. You know, sometimes it's all the way back from like 1885 or whatever, handwritten. But you look at all that stuff and you determine, okay, what are the things that are on here and how does that impact what I plan to develop or how I plan to operate the property? If there's an easement running through the back of the property and you plan on, I don't know, putting a pool back there or something, and somebody has an ability to walk through that area, you can't put a pool there, right? So you need to consider that, think about that. And when you go and like think about how am I going to use this property, you need to look at title to figure out whether you can use it as you think you can. Um, so that's that's sort of that whole thing. We like Dan said, we could talk about title for the future room. And then uh, mandatory removal items. These are like liens that are on your property or people's rights to purchase your property. Those things are things that you absolutely have to get removed, right? You do not want to buy a property with a lien on it. You do not want to buy a property with somebody has a right to purchase it ahead of you for a submarket price. Those are things that you know, if there's a lien, somebody could foreclose on the lien, a lender could say, okay, I'm taking the property, and then you don't have property, right? So these are things that you would ask a seller to remove. Typically, they're items that get removed just by paying money. So uh, those are things that usually a seller can easily get rid of. Uh, leases and contracts. So like I said, you want to talk to all of your tenants, but additionally, you want to get what's called an estoppel which is basically an agreement with your tenant saying, hey, there's no defaults under this lease. We're paying all of our rent. Our rent has been paid on time and we have no issues. Um, and then you wanna make sure that, uh, you know, the lease term is what you expect. There's no early termination rights, termination fees, and the lease is assignable. Now, that's really more of like, you're just making sure that the property, like generates cash as you would expect it to. If they have you know, a termination right, then they can just get out of the deal and then you don't have that lease, you don't have that cash flow. If you can't assign the lease, then you don't get the lease and then they can terminate the lease and then you don't get the cash flow. So this is all stuff where, you know, basically I would sum up due diligence is just making sure you're getting what you think you're getting by just looking at the property asking questions, figuring out what's going on and stuff. And that's a big part of what we do as lawyers is figuring that stuff out. Um, reps and warranties. I, I talked about this a little bit, but so in the contract itself, there will be disclosures that you'll ask a seller to make, like there's no environmental issues on the property. There are no tenants in default, et cetera. Um, they will, seller will want to limit that as much as possible, right? They don't want to give you reps. They don't want to tell you what's going on at the property. They want you to figure it out for yourself. They don't want to be liable for saying things that are incorrect. Um, a buyer on the other hand will want them to be expansive. They'll want a seller to say, uh, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with this property and go into detail about what is wrong with the property if there is anything. Um, so, Types of reps, um, you know, there, there's kind of the standard uh, contract reps. Uh, and then there's items that buyers unable to diligence. So, um, you know, things like 
if there's litigation that's been served on the seller that affects the property. That's very hard for a buyer to figure out without asking the seller to provide that information. So those are types of things that you really want to get covered by the reps. Uh, things that you can actually review, like looking at leases and looking at contracts. Yeah. What are some of the standard reps that you'd expect to see in the PSA? Yeah, so standard rep would be like, um, you know, the seller has uh, authority to execute the contract, you know, buyer has authority to execute the contract. Um, I would say that there's been no uh, defaults under any leases would probably be a, a pretty standard one that you would ask for. Uh, there's no known environmental conditions on the property, things like that. Um, and then as far as uh, the knowledge standard, so the seller, sellers typically have a lot of employees and uh, you know people that are operating the property. They want to limit their knowledge just to the executives or officers of the seller who are kind of dealing with the contract and helping negotiate the transaction, as opposed to like a lower level employee who might know about the issue at the property, but doesn't report up to the ultimate like executive seller who's negotiating. So those are the reps and warranties. Um, closing conditions. So another aspect of a PSA that you're really gonna wanna negotiate is what needs to get accomplished prior to closing. So some of the items that will need to get accomplished is one, you won't want the reps and warranties that were made at the time of signing to be untrue at the time of the closing. Usually, you know, a PSA lasts for about 60 days, 45 to 60 days. So there can be changes that happen. You, know, you can say, uh, well, there's no environmental issue on the property on day one, but then there does turn out to be an environmental issue on day 45. So you would want to know that that's true. And um, if it isn't true, you want to be able to walk away and receive your deposit back. Um, which I should say, if a closing condition is not satisfied at closing, the buyer typically can walk away from the deal and get their money back. That's how it works. Even if they've gone hard on their deposit? Yes, correct. Okay. Even if they've gone hard on their deposit, they can get their money back. Um, all right. Uh, performance of covenants is similar. Uh, there will be a number of covenants in a purchase and sale agreement. Uh, just basically, they won't enter into any leases. Uh, during the time that they sign to closing, they won't lean up the property, they won't uh, tear down a building, they won't waste the property. Those things you want to make sure are true as of the closing. If they're not, you walk away, you get your money back. Um, the title policy, so uh, we talked about title a little bit, but part of title is also not only you know, looking at what's going on, but getting an insurance policy so that if there is an issue down the line where they say, okay, actually somebody does have a right to your property, you have an insurance policy to back you up and say, okay, I have a clean insurance policy that says that I own this free and clear. Title companies step up and help you with this uh, claim that is being made against my property. Uh, tenant estoppels, you want to receive all of the tenant estoppels that you negotiated during the due diligence phase. Uh, third party approvals, sometimes you'll ask a third party uh, you know, to grant an easement in order to develop a property in a certain way. You will negotiate that in the PSA stage to make sure that you get that before you close. If you don't get it, you can walk away. Um, termination of contracts, any contracts you ask the seller to terminate, you want to make sure they terminate it. If not, you'd be able to uh, walk away from the deal. Um, condition of property. This one's really rare, but it does happen here and there uh, where you know there's a casualty, which is like a, a fire occurs or like a tornado or an earthquake or whatever. Um, if that is to occur prior to closing, then the risk of loss is on the seller. So you can, as a buyer, walk away from the deal 
and they will uh, uh, have to deal with whatever damage is done to the property. Uh, sometimes there's thresholds about what actually you know results in a seller or sorry buyer being able to walk away from the deal, and that gets pretty heavily negotiated. Uh, but it's really a rare occurrence. And then uh, delivery of purchase price and closing documents. Uh, that's another closing condition, obviously. The money needs to go in by the buyer uh, and then the closing documents that convey the property is the All right, and like we talked about, so conveyance documents, uh, the deed is the operative document that conveys the property, right? You record a deed in order to show conveyance of the property from a seller to a buyer. So that, that's the document that actually does the, the work of actually transferring the property. Uh, bill of sale is um, you know, it, a sale or a conveyance document for personal property rights. So uh, you know, furniture, uh, things that aren't quote unquote real estate, uh, fixtures as well. Um, assignment of leases is sort of, I think it, that makes sense. It's, you know, the leases get assigned by a separate document. The interest in the landlord as the, as the landlord gets transferred from the seller to the buyer. And then any contracts that you agree to assume get assigned from seller to buyer. Uh, rent roll, you'll want an updated rent roll, which is just basically like a, I don't know, like a roster or a list of all of the tenants at your property and how much rent they're paying. They'll provide you one of those as of the closing date. You also want all warranties to be transferred and make sure you've gotten all of, like the necessary consents from the warranty providers. Um, notices to tenants. So once you transfer property, you wanna make sure that the tenants are also paying rent in the right location because previously they were paying rent to your seller. So now you need to tell them, okay, actually you gotta pay money for this bank account. So you transfer money or you send a notice to the tenants to pay money directly to you instead of seller. Uh, closing statement will set forth kind of all of the, uh, you know, who pays what at closing, title costs, um, escrow costs, uh, you know, taxes for the year, uh, different, different items that get prorated. And then the books and records is just how, you know, the actual records of how the property was run. Uh, you'll need that in the future uh, for tax purposes or if people ask questions and you'll, you'll want to look at how uh, the property has been run in the past. Uh, okay, and I think the last section here is just remedies. Uh, and we've talked about it throughout. So uh, as we said, prior to the date in which you deliver your approval notice approving due diligence, a buyer pretty much can walk away for any reason, right? They can say, for whatever reason, I don't want to buy this property and they can receive their deposit that they put in back. After a buyer delivers an approval notice, their hands are a little bit more tied. They can only really walk away if seller does something bad and defaults or a closing condition fails to uh, be satisfied. Uh, if none of those things happen and a buyer decides still, I don't want to buy the property, they lose their deposit. Um, additionally, if a buyer does something bad, which could be, uh, you know, typically it's the not going through with the sale, uh, that can be declared a default. If it's declared a default, uh, once again, they can receive the deposit as liquidated damages. Um, also, if a seller defaults, so a seller does something bad, uh, such as the worst thing a seller can do is not convey the property and convey it to somebody else after you go through the whole process of, you know, diligencing it and figuring out whether or not you want to buy the property. Seller decides I got a better deal. I'm going to sell it to someone else. Uh, you can actually force the seller to sell the property to you, which is uh, typically called an act taking an action in specific performance uh, or injunctive relief. And that is, you know, 
actually making a seller convey the property to you. Additionally, you can get other damages. You can get uh, your costs for doing diligence. Um, it's usually an option of the buyer to decide what they want to do. Um, so that's it. I believe. Any other questions? Hi, everybody. My name is Alex Davis. I'm a partner in the real estate group at Mayor Brown here in Los Angeles. And so we're going to talk about joint ventures now. Um, I'm going to ask you guys some questions to kind of help lead this discussion. So I definitely like this more to be kind of like a conversation than me just talking at you guys for half an hour. So uh, to the extent you guys have anything to say or any questions, feel free to, to chime in. So uh, let's just start this off. What's a joint venture? Can somebody answer that. Yeah, that's, that, that's one way to think about it. Anybody else? So uh, the key here is multiple people. Whenever you have uh, a joint venture, there's, you're going to have one or more people coming together for some common purpose. Um, this could be to own and operate a property. This could be to develop a property. Um, but what, why would you have two people come together? More capital, yeah, exactly. More capital. Any other reasons? Less liability. Less liability. Spreading out the liability amongst multiple people. So th those are those are absolutely reasons why people enter into a joint venture. Um, you know, another reason could be that one person has a certain expertise that the other person doesn't have. So. You know, for example, you see this happening in, in uh, development transactions all the time where there's a, there's a piece of real estate, somebody owns the dirt, and they want to build something, but they, they just own it. They don't know how to build it. Uh, they might not have the money to build it. So they can bring a team of people together where you have the capital necessary to actually afford to build whatever it is you want to build. And you could have the person who has the skill to, to build it and to bring all the people together in order to build it. And that could be like a developer. And so that, that's a typical setup for a joint venture in a real estate context. So for purposes of, of this talk, I'm gonna to refer to the two, really like two partners. One of them is a developer partner. The other one is the capital partner. You can have situations where there's more partners or you know, not a development context, but I think a uh, development situation uh, best exemplifies a lot of the um, issues that you see in joint ventures. So um, now let's say that you, you have this idea to have a joint venture. Do you use a joint venture for one project or multiple projects? Oh, what's that? I'd say one and then make another one. If you do it. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly one way to do it. Uh, Two typical ways. One way is you form one joint venture, and then if, if that goes well and you want to do another deal with, with your partner, you form another joint venture. And so each time there's a new property, you form a new joint venture. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is you form one joint venture, in it, and as you find new projects to do with people, you can actually amend the joint venture and just add an additional project. And so th there's different reasons why you'd want to do that. The, the most common reason why you would form one joint venture to handle multiple projects is if you want to have uh, sort of an aggregated uh, financial interest amongst all of the various projects. So let's say that in your joint venture relationship with a particular person, you have financial tests where if, if uh, the venture does really well, then the developer might get a little extra money or a fee or something like that. So if you have the various projects aggregated into one joint venture, then if, if one project's not doing so well, then the other might help make up for it. So that, that's where you can um, often see that come up. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is management. Management is one of the most highly negotiated aspects of a joint venture relationship. Um, so just to start it off, which partner typically has the right to manage the venture? Does anybody know? So typically 
the person that has the money, who the most money in the project, they, they're the ones who want to have a say. They want to have the ultimate strong management powers. And in the event that there's something important is going to happen, they want to be the one to really make the determination as to what's going to happen with, with exceptions. So where this becomes really highly negotiated is, well, you know, how much does one particular partner have in the venture compared to another? And so in a lot of development oriented joint ventures, you can see situations where the capital partner could have 95% of the equity in the project and the developer only has 5%. So you can imagine situations like that where the capital partner who has 95% of, of the money in the deal and really 95% of the risk in a lot of ways, they want to be able to, to drive the bus. And in those situations, often what you see in the, in the joint venture agreements is effectively every decision of significance is going to be able to be made by the capital partner in their sole discretion and only for you know, very limited topics would the developer partner have a say. And in those situations, the general idea is that the capital partner makes the decisions and the developer partner goes out and implements the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, can anybody think of topics where both partners would want to say or should have a say, even if there's a big disparity in, in the amount they have invested? So here's one. So let's say that um, the developers or the, let's say the capital partner says, uh, I think I want to be done with this project. We're just going to sell the property and dissolve the entity, distribute out the assets. That's something typically that would be a joint decision where a small partner would have a say, even though they are just a small partner. Uh, another example would be if one, if one partner wants to buy another piece of real property in the joint venture, related or unrelated to the, to the project, that's typically a joint decision where both parties will have a say, regardless of how much money they have in the project. So on the flip side, can anybody think of when when a partner might not want to have a say? Maybe like the person that has the money, like doesn't want to have a say in like the, the like there's a utility safety in the building, so like there's a developer knows how to like implement the electrical system, plumbing, all that kind of stuff. But the developer or the person with the money doesn't know anything about it. Yeah, I mean that, that that's a good example of where. The, they want the developer to go out to, to kind of handle the day-to-day the -day more minutia type things where the capital partner might want to be responsible for approving kind of large scale plans and specifications as opposed to going out and building, building that. Another example could be, so let's say that you, you finish building the building and now it's time to lease it. Let's, let's say this is a multifamily project with you know, 500 units most likely the capital partner isn't going to want to approve every single lease that comes up, even though that, that lease is going to have to be signed ultimately by somebody with some authority within the venture. They're not going to want to do that. They don't want to be bothered with it. So they could actually specifically carve out, excuse me, from the responsibility of the, uh, from, from the approval rights that the capital partner would have approval of the leases. And what they would say is that the, developer can enter into leases so long as they fit within some specified leasing criteria. That's how they typically address that. Okay, so let's move on to capital contributions and distribution. So this is something that gets a lot of focus on, especially by the business folks involved in a deal as distinguished from the lawyers. This is an area of the document that's absolutely critical that you read when, when you're the, the business person actually forming a deal. Because just kind of stepping back from, from a kind of like looking at this from a practical perspective for a second, when you hire a lawyer to draft a joint venture, and you're gonna give them some general ideas of what you're looking for, and the lawyer's gonna sit down and draft this. This is how this almost always happens. The lawyer's gonna interpret what you've said 
and is going to make a, a document that represents what you told them as far as they've understood that. Uh, out of a lot of areas, these capital contributions, distributions, how they work, um, it's, it's absolutely critical that you get it right. Because if, if it's not right, money is going to be this either uh, required to be put into the company in a way that maybe the partners didn't actually intend to. And had they have read it very thoroughly, they would have caught that. And, and same for goes with uh, money coming out of the company. It, this happens on you know everything from small transactions to, to very, very large transactions. So it's it, may, it might seem obvious sitting here thinking like, of course, like I'm gonna read this document that someone's asking me to sign, but you know, you could have billion dollar joint ventures where people think, oh, like the lawyer's got it, they'll just draft it. I, I told them what to do. And that, that can be a kind of a, a recipe for disaster. So, so speaking of capital contributions, well, what is a capital contribution now that I've talked about? Money, can it be anything besides money? You have land. So let, let's say that you are a, uh, a developer and you've somehow managed to acquire some raw piece of land. And you find a um, capital partner who has a lot of money that they can help you help invest in the property to build whatever you want to build. You know, you, you know, you're bringing something of value to the partnership other than your skills, you're bringing a piece of land. And so that land should have value when you bring it to the venture. So by contributing the property itself to the venture, that, that in itself is a capital contribution. So let's say that I have a, I have a piece of land that is worth, um, I don't know, $100,000. What would my capital contribution be? Hundred thousand. That that that's certainly the the obvious answer. Um, however, it might not be it might not be hundred thousand. It could be it could be less, or it could be more. Or you can see it be less. Is let's say that the developer um, has had the land for a long time, and maybe they only pay fifty thousand dollars for it. In certain situations a capital partner when coming up with the overall uh, percentage equity in the deal and how, and how much capital people are deemed to have invested, they might only, we think it was a credit, they might only credit the developer's land is worth $50,000 instead of $100,000. So that's something that can be negotiated. Uh, obviously, if you're the person bringing the uh, land to the table, then it could be, uh, you certainly want to be as close to fair market value as possible. Or if you think that it's, it's really worth more than what that is, than, than what you paid for it, or what it's appraised to be, then you can try to argue for a little bit more. Uh, so, the, so capital contributions, those are something that happens at the, at the formation of the venture, an initial capital contribution that is. Um, so that takes us to capital calls. Uh, does anybody know what a capital call is? So capital call is once the venture has been formed, it's the a party to the venture says, hey, we, we thought we had enough money, um, and, but we didn't. And so they, they send out a capital call to the partners, and the partners are responsible for you know, contributing to the venture whatever that required amount is. And, and there's rules to, to when you can call capital, how much capital you can call. Sometimes you can't call capital at all. It all depends on what's negotiated in the venture. Um, but, but let's assume for a second that uh, the partner who's calling the capital has the right to call the capital. And the other partner says, no, I, I'm not gonna put in the money or I can't put in the money to have it. Uh, what happens then? And they just say, okay, like that's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to contribute money, that's okay. So typically, failure to contribute capital when you're required to, that, that's a big deal. And so there's, there's two main remedies that the other, part, other partners will have. Uh, one is the partner who uh, has already contributed capital, they might say, you know, I get why you need the money. I'm going to kick in the, the amount that you didn't put in. 
because I still want to say the project built. That, that's what happens a lot. And so that partner then, depending on how the documents are set up, that can either be a loan. So effectively, the, the partner who ends up making the contribution for the other person, he could that additional money he's putting in could be considered a loan to the partner that did not put in the money. And so, the, the, so then the partner that's making the loan gets interest. It could be like 18% interest on the money that uh, the other partner is going to have to pay back. They're never going to get any money out of the venture until they pay back that loan with interest. So that, that's one way to discourage partners from, from not making capital contributions as a result of capital calls. Um, the other main thing that you see is that if the partner does not make the required capital contribution and another partner does, rather than it being a loan, it's, it's considered an additional equity investment. And so the, the party who invested the money their interest in the venture goes up. So maybe they started at 95%, a 95% partner. They can now maybe be like a 96% partner, 97% partner. So you're diluting the partner that didn't invest the money. You know, where this, um, where, what you can see, especially in more, you know, private equity oriented arrangements, you might have what they call punitive dilution. So let's say that you, you invest, one partner invests the money in lieu of the other person investing it. Instead of it just being a kind of a one-to-one -one dilution, you might be credited, you know, effectively two dollars for every dollar that you put into the venture. So you're going to very quickly squeeze out the smaller person and disincentivize them from uh, failing to make the uh, required capital call contributions. So, so now we're talking about money going in. Uh, the next is money going out. So I, I've said, what is, what is a waterfall on here? So I, I, I've given you a hint, it's money going out, but why, why do we call it a waterfall? So we, we call it a waterfall because if, if, you, if you picture in your mind's eye a waterfall, you have kind of water coming over and it landing in a little pool, then it continues down to another pool until it reaches whatever's at the bottom. A, a waterfall in a joint venture, it, it sets out what happens when you have a bucket of money that you need to distribute to the partners. And so what you could have is um, if, for example, you had a partner that made a, a, a default loan, like I described, so they would get money before anybody else does. That would be like the first level of the waterfall. Then let's say you got a situation where you know, the same project that we're talking about, you, you, uh, there was a cost overrun when it came to build, cost more to build the thing than you thought it would, and someone kicked in some money to build it. So you have a cost overrun. The next level of the waterfall might be returning cost overruns. And then you get to another level in a waterfall, and that could be then you return whatever money you have left after you've kind of filled up the other buckets up top, you would just return it to the partners in accordance with their interest in the venture. So it could be 95% to this person and 5% to this person, if this was a 95-5 joint venture. So that, that's, that's what a waterfall is. Um, and very closely related to that is, is the concept of promote. Has anybody heard of that term before? This is a good like cocktail party kind of term that you'll hear people throw out. So a, a promote is one of these things that it can, it can seem complicated, but really what it is, is it's, a, it's just a disproportionate distribution. So for example, let's say that this was a joint venture where the capital partner had 95% of the interest and the developer had 5%. You could have a level of the waterfall that says, even though normally it's 95, five, we're gonna give 20% to the developer. And then we're gonna split the remaining 80%, 95, five. And so that 20% that's gonna go right to the developer, that's good. That's the problem right there. And so, the purpose of the, and, and where the promote comes in is typically the developer only gets the promote if the property achieves certain levels of return. And, and often when the property achieves higher and higher returns, the promote will get bigger and bigger. And so this incentivizes a developer who has only put a small amount of money into the project to do a really good job 
can make that property generate a lot of returns because the more returns it generates, it's getting an exponential increase in its in the, the profits, even though it's not injecting more money itself into the project. Okay, so let's move to covenants. Okay, so so a covenant is generally speaking, it's just a, it's just a promise. You know, if I say that you know, I'm I'm going to give you five dollars in exchange for you know you mowing my lawn, like that that's a covenant. Any kind of promise is, is a covenant. So there's a number of covenants in joint venture agreements, like in, in any other legal contract. A legal contract is effectively a set of covenants with some other stuff that you put in there as well. So one of the covenants you see come up in joint ventures often is um, a, a key person covenant. So what, what is a key person? Does anybody know? Take, take a guess. It's, it's self-descriptive. Something with a large amount of equity in their financial assets. Typically, that's typically not equity. Oriented. Typically, uh, the, the key person is somebody who's very important to the, to the success of the venture. So, where you see this is in a development context, uh, there might be somebody at the developer who is absolutely crucial for getting the project built and the stuff. Where you see this happen a lot is uh, again in the development context. Most develop, I say most developers, a lot of developers are smaller operations than say like a big private equity firm. So you could have these you know, relatively small family owned developers that are constructing these you know, $100 million buildings. And so what the, develop, what the capital partner says is we wanna make sure that whoever we think we're doing business with you know, this, from in the small family owned shop that they're gonna be around. So pretend it's me. So let's say I'm the developer and it's, it's Alex Davis. Alex Davis is the key person. What the joint venture agreement would say is if Alex Davis no longer works for the developer or if he gets hit by a bus or something, that something needs to happen. You need to usually find a replacement key person because without Alex Davis running the project, you know we have no confidence in the project and the wheels are gonna fall off and the capital partner is gonna lose all its money. So the idea is that there's a really important person as part of the venture, and it, that person needs to stay in there the whole time, or they need to be replaced by somebody with, with somebody that's reasonably approved by the capital partner. And, and you can have a lot of negotiation just around that concept. Um, the next is, is non-compete. I'm gonna hit these kind of quick, so make sure we don't run out of time here. Uh, the, the next is a non-compete covenant. This is something that, when you're putting together a deal, this often comes up very early on in, in the letter of intent stage of a deal, or at least it should, um, especially if you're considering doing repeat business. Oftentimes these, these ventures, it's very rare when, you, when you're thinking you're just gonna do one deal with a particular partner. The, idea, the typical idea is you know, you're gonna do a deal with them, see how it goes, and then maybe do some more deals with them in the future. And so what you'll often have in a joint venture agreement is a non-compete covenant. You, these come in, in different flavors. The, the, the two most common is one of them would be that if, um, if the developer partner comes across some other opportunity, then before they can either buy the property or start building it or have any interest in it whatsoever, they need to come to you, to the capital partner, to give you a shot to, to do the deal or not. And at that point, this is where the negotiations can kind of deviate. So let's say that the developer brings you that opportunity and the capital partner says, no, I don't want to do it. In some situations, then the, the developer partner can't do the deal at all until the property is maybe completely built or it's completely leased up and stabilized. But uh, what a developer would, would try to argue is say, no, like that, that's too aggressive. You can't just prevent us from executing on you know, on deals generally, but rather, um, you know, we'll, we have to bring our deals to you first, but if you don't want to do the deal, then we can take it to somebody else. So that can be thought of as like a, a right of first refusal or a right of first offer. So those are the, the two main flavors that, that those come in. Um, so let's say that you have, uh, you know, you have a number of covenants in, in a document. What happens if, if a partner breaches a covenant? Again, in, in the developer capital partner context, 
the person who's breaching is typically going to be the developer because the developer has most of the obligations. Once the joint venture is formed, usually the capital partner is just there for the money. So if the developer breaches a covenant, typically the capital partner can remove them as the developer and bring somebody else. That, that, that's a typical uh, that, that's a typical remedy. And the triggers to get to that point where you can actually remove the developer as the kind of the operator of the project, those are all highly negotiated things which go, go beyond the amount of time that we have right now. Um, so the next thing to think about, again, this is, this is a practical thing that should be thought about pretty early on is, you know, who are you doing a deal with? Is this person credit worthy? In, in a lot of transactions, you could have, uh, especially sophisticated parties, when they're entering into a joint venture, they might want to form a new entity to be the partner in the joint venture as opposed to it being their mothership entity. And when they do that, you could have somebody who's effectively not credit worthy with zero assets entering into agreements to provide large sums of money. So effectively, you could be entering into a contract with somebody who you have very little, little legal recourse against without it becoming a giant mess. So the, the way that you solve that is, is you understand from the get-go, you know, you say, what entity is going to be party to this joint venture? And then you, you think to yourself, you know, is, is that credit worthy or not? So for example, if it was, you know, Amazon Inc., I don't know if that's the name of it, but if it's Amazon Inc., I'm pretty sure Amazon Inc. is credit worthy, as opposed to, you know, Amazon 1234, Grove Street LLC that's so specific to that project that probably has no assets. That entity, even though it's ultimately owned by Amazon, it might not have any assets whatsoever you could go after if you have to sue it. Whether, whether you could go after the assets of the parent company, that's another story, but you don't want to have to be thinking about that in the first place. And so what you do is just know who you're um, contracting with and you know perhaps get a guarantee from somebody credit worthy if that person you're contracting with is not credit worthy. Okay, so we, we, we've talked about forming a joint venture, putting money into the joint venture, uh, the covenants that are, you know, just a couple of the covenants that are in joint venture agreement. So uh, let's say things are progressing and it's time to, to get out of the joint venture. There's a few different options. Um, one of them would be a forced sale. That's sort of what it sounds like. That's a right that, of one partner to say that, you know, I, I don't want to be in this anymore. And so I think the partnership should sell whatever the assets it has, typically a piece of real property, so they could force a sale of the real property. Um, another exit right that's pretty typical is what's called a buy-sell. And this can come up in a variety of contexts. Typically, it's tied to some event or some point in time, for example, it could be five years after you formed the venture, or it could be um, once the property has been completely built and leased up to say 95% you know, occupied, but usually there's some event. Uh, and so a buy sell, what that is, is it allows one party to say, you know, I think that uh, the property is worth X dollars. I want out. I think it's it's worth X dollars, and you and you effectively give the other partner a right to buy you out or buy them out. So effectively, you're playing chicken with the person. You're saying that you know I don't want to be a partner with you anymore, and one of us is leaving, and you get to choose. And if the other person doesn't choose, then the person who initiated the buy sell process they they do get to choose. Um, and so. We're running out of time here, but just real quickly, in terms of other exit rights, there's a number of other ways to get out of the venture. Um, one that you'll see that, that's more common is a transfer right. And so what that means is, let's say that the, uh, the capital partner wants out of the deal. Where you would see this happen, and uh, we're actually seeing this currently in this market, especially with the whole, you know, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you have, um, partners who may want to get out of ventures that could be related to uh, you know, entities that are, are not certainly not what's highly upon right now. And so what the partner trying to leave 
would do is they might try to sell their interest in the venture to somebody else. And so you're not selling the real property, but you're selling your interest in the venture. So that would be considered a transfer. So that, that's about all the time that we have for today on joint ventures, but uh, hope you guys picked up a few things. And the, the, the key thing to remember is it's a long-term relationship. Know what you're getting yourself into and what the big picture terms are before you sign anything. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, Trisha, are you still on? I see her on here. I am. I think, I, Trisha, can we hear you? Can you hear me okay? Uh, very okay. Tight. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Let me know once you can turn it. Will she be able to control the slides? I can just let you know when when to forward the slides if that works. All right, Trisha, can you give us a test on the audio? Testing, can you hear me? Yes, that's a good volume. You can okay. hear it right, yeah, okay. Okay, are we ready to go then? I think so. I actually, uh, could somebody uh, advance the slides for Trisha? I've ever heard of that. Sure. Okay, and I'll, I can let you know when to move them along. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Trisha Greenlee, and apologies that my portion of the presentation may not be as interactive as some of the other folks have made theirs. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it in person today. Um, as with the others you've heard from today, I am uh, an attorney practicing with Mayor Brown. Uh, I started my career years ago practicing like kind of generalized real estate. Uh, but at some point along the way, I requested uh, more opportunities to work in leasing. And over the last decade, my practice has evolved exclusively into a commercial leasing practice. Um, so as you're aware, uh, a lease is an agreement whereby an owner of property conveys to another third party uh, an interest to use uh, that real property for a specified time. Uh, that's the most basic definition we've got. Um, you're probably most familiar with this arrangement in the residential context, as most of you have probably at one time or another leased an apartment or a house. Um, with respect to our legal practice, the types of leases we handle most commonly are commercial leases and commercial leases can run the gamut um, among like the sectors that are listed here, uh, office, retail slash restaurant space, industrial, warehouse, manufacturing, life science, and data center systems. Um, so there's no one size fits all form of lease that can be applied effectively across um, these sectors. Um, so a leasing practice can become rather special. Uh, for example, as Dan mentioned earlier, I specialize in life science leasing. Um, life science and lab tenants tend to use hazardous materials um, as a part of their day-to-day -day business in development of uh, pharmaceuticals and other things. Uh, and landlords, life science landlords are very interested in getting space back at the end of a term that is free of hazardous materials that they can turn around and lease to the next tenant. So hazardous materials provisions in life uh, science leases tend to be way more robust than they would be in um, an office lease, for example. Um, uh, as another example, data centers, uh, data centers tend to have very specialized requirements for like their cooling of equipment. So uh, there are provisions very specific to uh, availability of cooling and electricity and what happens when things go down um, that are very specific to data center leases 
um, that you won't see elsewhere. So next slide, please. So with respect to commercial leasing, um, there are typically a, a number of individuals or groups that are involved in the process. Um, most obvious um, and integral are the landlord and the tenant parties. Um, without them, none of the rest of this is happening. Um, and you're probably pretty well aware of the role that the brokers have in putting the leasing transactions together. Um, as they're the ones who will generally take the lead, um, again, much like a residential context um, with marketing available space to third parties um, and assisting with negotiating the basic transaction terms. Uh, landlords may also be looking to underwriters to assist them um, once potential commitments for a particular transaction has been identified. Um, to help them review and determine the credit worthiness of those tenants um, to ensure, among other things, that they're not only financial, financially viable in um, covering their lease obligations, but um, to the extent they've got better credit, tenants with stronger credit can enhance the value of the landlord's property. Um, which could be an important factor for a landlord that's looking to uh, eventually sell uh, their property or put it in a, a joint venture. Uh, in cases where a landlord is willing to perhaps uh, accept a tenant whose credit isn't as strong, an underwriter can help the landlord determine what kind of security um, should be collected from the tenant uh, to protect the landlord in the event um, things go wrong uh, during the lease term. And we'll talk about security deposits, those kinds of um, security mechanisms uh, a little bit later. Uh, as I'll skip down to the bottom, as attorneys, um, we are brought into this process at a, one or another stage. So sometimes we're brought in at the stage where the parties are still trying to get the transaction terms together. So we'll assist in putting term sheets together and letters of intent. Um, otherwise, sometimes that's done before uh, we're involved in the process. We'll receive a letter of intent uh, for term sheet and uh, prepare documentation based on what the parties have uh, concluded are their transaction terms and will assist in negotiating and getting that piece documentation put together. Um, design and construction teams uh, can be important. Uh, depending on the nature of the transaction, uh, there may be design and transaction teams that or involved representing the landlord side and others representing the tenant side. Um, for example, where you have a landlord with uh, just a piece of dirt who's planning to construct a building and, and uh, improve a project for lease to others, uh, you may have a situation where that landlord is building the building structure and taking care of all of the improvements out by that building structure, but have tenants coming in um, with their own design teams to design and construct the improvements for their own specific spaces. So that may be a, a, a lot of people um, that are having to uh, get involved early on in the process so that it's all integrated um, and, and can get uh, fairly complicated. And lastly, our asset management teams, while they do exactly that, um, tend to focus on managing the assets, they may be getting involved early in the documentation and negotiation process where there may be a specialized property or a specialized um, operational aspect that the tenant would require that they might need to get involved with, with to make sure that uh, they can accommodate it um, operationally during the lease term. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, as I just touched on, uh, the commercial leasing process generally follows a fairly typical process, um, starting with the listing of the space, um, marketing by the brokers, and the development then of a letter of intent or term sheet that um, serves as the basis for uh, the documentation to be shared later. Uh, the preparation and negotiation of the lease documentation, uh, and then the delivery of the space to the tenant um, in whatever condition it's been agreed to. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, we can kind of go all over the map in terms of how long these processes might be for any particular transaction. Um, what we see as standards is, you know, simple transactions might take four to six weeks and your most sophisticated, complicated transactions could take six, nine months, even a year. Uh, although we try and avoid dragging uh, transactions out quite that long. Um, it certainly has happened. Next slide. So letters of intent and term sheets. Uh, the initial terms of a leasing transaction will generally be outlined, as I've mentioned, in a term sheet or a letter of intent. Um, they're going to be limited in nature and won't include some of the key provisions um, that everybody's going to want to see in the lease document. Um, once we start negotiating too much into a letter of intent, it starts looking a lot like the lease itself. So uh, we really try and keep them limited to the business terms. Um, and But the key thing with respect to both term sheets and letters of intent is that um, they're non-binding. Um, just for the reason I just stated, uh, they're going to be limited in nature in terms of what they address. Um, so we don't want either party uh, being able to make uh, an assertion that this is a fully fully loaded document that should govern the uh, relationship between the parties for any period of time. Um, it's just, they're just going to serve as the basis as uh, for the um, more formalized documentation. Uh, as reflected on our slide here, they're really going to give us those basic terms. Who, what, where, and when. So they're going to include uh, some specific terms relating to the description of the space, how much square footage you're dealing with, where in the location uh, within a building the space is located, uh, the, the outside perimeter walls so that there isn't um, any discrepancy with what the tenant thinks they're getting and the landlord thinks they're leasing. Um, permitted use, uh, this is important uh, for, of course, various reasons. Number one being, you need to know what kind of lease you're uh, document you're going to need to support the use, um, and for other reasons we'll talk about a little later. Uh, the term of the lease, uh, how long is the tenant going to have uh, to use the space, and um, when is that term going to start? Uh, and the term and the condition of delivery are, are tied and important. Um, examples of what we might see as condition of delivery. Uh, if a space is delivered in as is, uh, we're going to be able to deliver that space uh, on the earliest basis. And so you'll have a commencement date um, that's as soon as you're going to get. Uh, you may have situations where there's a build out for uh, being done by the tenant, in which case, the space will be delivered to them and they'll be given a period of time um, in which to build out those improvements. Um, or alternatively, the landlord may be constructing improvements for the tenant themselves, um, in which case uh, the commencement date won't happen until the landlord has completed um, those improvements for the tenant. So you have a point in time 
where your lease commences and the space is turned over to the tenant. And you may have a separate, separate point in time um, when the tenant then is required to actually start paying rent. And so these uh, items will be specifically addressed in uh, your letter of intent or term sheet. Um, and pretty importantly, how much rent is the tenant going to be paying? Um, and how is that initial base rent amount going to increase over uh, the life of the term of your lease? And what other uh, costs and expenses is the tenant responsible for? Um, we'll talk about operating expenses um, in just a moment being one category. Um, with respect to retail slash restaurant leases, uh, you may have a separate component where uh, on top of base rents or instead of base rents, um, which are typically a dollar amount per month, uh, you may have rents that are based on the uh, gross uh, receipts of the tenant and they'll pay a percentage of the gross receipts um, of their business that is conducted uh, in the system. So, uh, these are probably the, the minimum terms that we would end up seeing in a uh, term sheet or letter of intent. So they can definitely get more uh, details than, than just these items. Next, next please. So our types of leases, the leases end up getting categorized based on how landlords' operating costs um, are treated. So um, our first uh, reference here is to a triple net lease. And a triple net lease um, is one that we call its net of operating expenses. And that means that theoretically, all of the expenses that the landlord is incurring um, with respect to the maintenance operation um, repairs of the building are going to end up getting passed through 100% to the tenants of that project. So these costs can include uh, the taxes, uh, property taxes payable, the cost of insurance, um, policies and premiums, uh, the cost of maintaining and repairing uh, the building, day-to-day uh, -day operations, such as staff, editorial, engineering, things like that, all of those costs are going to be pulled and then passed through to the tenant on a pro rata basis based on the amount of square footage a particular tenant is leasing um, in, in, uh, concept, in, in relation to how much the, the square footage there is in the project. So as an example, if you have a tenant um, leasing 10,000 square feet in a 50,000 square foot building, uh, your 10,000 square foot tenant is going to pay about 20% of the cost um, that the landlord incurs in this triple net structure. Um, a gross lease is one where the base rent amount that is payable monthly by the tenant already includes a predetermined amount for expenses um, payable during the term uh, estimated on, by the landlord on its historical record. Um, if costs go up for the landlord during the term, it's not gonna be able, be able to recoup those costs from the tenant who's locked into a um, gross base rent amount structure. Um, so that's definitely, that's, that's a downside for landlords, of course. Um, and these structures, tend to be seen most often um, in industrial leases and uh, retail. Uh, the gross with a base year is a little bit of a combination of, of the other two. Uh, so operate, no operating expenses are gonna be payable when, uh, during the first year, generally when you have a gross lease with a uh, base year. So, uh, no, as I just stated, no operating expenses payable uh, for the first year after the commencement date. Um, landlord can only pass through charges for increases in costs 
over uh, the cost incurred by the landlord during that base year. So as an example, which hopefully makes uh, what I stated just more clear, um, let's say that your lease provides for a 2022 base year and started on January 1st of 2022. Uh, the tenant will only have to pay base rent and no expenses until December 31st, 2022. And at the end of 2022, beginning of the 2023 calendar year, the landlord is going to calculate what its operating costs were uh, for 2022. And the tenant will end up paying its share of the delta between the cost that the landlord incurs in 2023 over the cost that the landlord had uh, incurred in 2022. Um, so if the landlord's operating costs for 2022 were a million dollars and the costs for 2023 were 1.2 million, um, our tenant will pay its share of 200,000 which is uh, the delta in that um, cost structure. Um, tenants are gonna be concerned about expenses. So lease provisions relating to um, the operating costs like uh, that I've just described um, tend to be fairly highly negotiated um, and will include laundry lists of items that um, cannot be passed through as part of expenses um, and identify costs that the landlord is going to be required to maybe amortize rather than charge in a particular year. Uh, those tend to be capital in nature, like roof replacements uh, and items that are going to be um, larger cost items. And um, provisions for operating expenses also tend to include audit rights so that the tenants can um, look at the, the landlord's books and records and, and confirm that they're not uh, pay more than they should be. Next slide, please. So lease documentation can really end up all over the map due to a number of different factors, but um, they're going to integrate the business terms that we've discussed that are um, provided to us in the letter of intent or the term sheet. Um, and as you see listed on this first slide, um, We've got some of the basic terms we've already covered. We're going to, we're going to use our defined uh, premises. Uh, we're going to have a discussion about uh, how long the term of the lease is, what condition the space will be delivered in, and all of the detail that goes in around that. Um, if there's going to be a build out of the space for the tenant, there's going to be um, a specific work letter that governs um, the details of that, that build out. Um, we're going to have our detailed provisions regarding the operating costs um, on the, the triple net gross or gross with the base year basis. And um, we're going to provide for the type of security that's required under the lease, whether that's a security deposit, um, how large that security deposit will be, and how it can be applied um, during the term if the tenant defaults. Um, in other situations, there may be a guarantee of the lease by a more creditworthy individual or, or uh, entity uh, as an additional security that can be tapped into in the event of default. Um, there's going to be a language dictating um, the use, as we talked about a little bit earlier. And this can be important not just to identify basically what the space can be used for. Um, but to preclude tenants from changing the use of the space um, that a landlord may think, you know, they're leasing office space to a tenant that tenant doesn't do so well and maybe uh, decides they want to open a restaurant or, or a lounge, um, which would require different improvements, different uh, permitting, different things like that. So um, it, it allows the landlord to have control over what the tenants are using the space for. Uh, parking rights, limited space means limited availability of parking, and this becomes important uh, for tenants and that they want to make sure, uh, you know, in an office situation or non-retail situation, there's enough parking for their employees, and the retail tenants, of course, want to have parking for their customers. So um, there tend to be fairly 
uh, detailed provisions allocating them, uh, parking among the tenants and dictating uh, how, how the parking can be uh, used uh, and be what. Okay, next slide, please. So there's going to be standard provisions in, in the lease relating to uh, who's responsible for obtaining and paying for things like utilities, uh, making repairs to the building, the project, the, the, the lease space, and who's responsible for the maintenance of, of those various items. Um, so those tend to be fairly straightforward. Um, the leases are going to dictate uh, the amounts of insurance that the landlord and the tenant are required to maintain, um, the types and amounts, and you know, landlords typically having at a minimum a requirement that they have property insurance that covers uh, the value of the building structure itself in the project, um, not including what the tenants own inside their spaces. Um, and landlords are also going to be required to, to hold general liability insurance. On the flip side, uh, tenants will going to be tasked with carrying the property insurance for their own belongings in their space, also having general liability insurance and other um, standard requirements like workers' compensation and things like that. Assignment and subletting. Uh, these are important provisions for both parties because the landlord's going to want to restrict um, who their tenant can assign or sublease their space to. And, you know, at the front end, the tenant is, or the landlord, excuse me, is signing up the particular tenant um, because they like that tenant, maybe they like the business, uh, the credit worthiness of that particular tenant. And so they don't want tenants to be able to just assign. Um, to any third party um, and, and have the landlord ending up with uh, a, a third party, you know, that they're, they don't have any knowledge of that may not be able to have, might not have the financial viability to cover its obligations. Um, on the flip side, the tenants are gonna want flexibility so that if they determine down the line, perhaps they have leased too much space, um, and they would like to bring in someone else to um, sublease a portion of the space they're doing business in, or if they just want to get out from under the lease altogether, um, they're of course going to want to have uh, as much flexibility as possible. Um, defaults and remedies. Uh, default sections are going to make clear um, to the parties the types of actions and inactions that are going to result in the default under the lease, um, which would give the non-defaulting party um, some sort of recourse. And um, default provisions will list the types of defaults specifically and generally give a cure period um, that the defaulting party has to remedy those defaults. Um, most simple to come up with is a, a failure of a tenant to pay rent um, within a certain period after uh, notice that the rent is due. Um, that would become a default uh, by the tenant under the lease, which would allow the, the landlord um, various remedies uh, available to it under law or under the agreement, including terminating. Uh, provisions relating to landlord defaults uh, don't tend to be quite as robust as tenant default provisions. Um, and, and, and landlords want to limit those because if you start giving tenant rights to terminate leases, uh, because of landlord defaults, you can run into uh, problems again when you're looking to sell, when you're looking to finance a property, um, or enter into a joint venture structure because um, third parties don't want to see tenants that have a, a potential out uh, from their leases. Um, we're running up on time here, so I'll just say, um, you know, we have some additional types of provisions listed here, and, and there may be special provisions included in leases, um, such as those here, the expansion rights where tenants may have to expand into additional space beyond what they've originally leased, or extend the term 
um, of their lease beyond um, their original term. Uh, these are tenant concessions and don't really have an upside for the landlord. So landlords prefer not to give these types of provisions um, in leases, but for a long time, market standards have kind of dictated that they do. So um, they're pretty typical. Um, so while this has been a, a general review of some leasing basics, the reality is that um, certain commercial leasing transactions uh, be you know, subject to lots of intricacies and, and different factors that will dictate um, the detail and complexity of the transaction um, and documentation. And um, hopefully I've given a uh, uh, good overview. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna finish up with uh, finance now. Um, and we'll try to, uh, I think we'll finish up early. Mark and his, um, uh, fund formation thoughts. So um, just quickly on financing, why would you borrow money in connection with real property? Uh, I guess we started in the back, yeah, all the way back. Sorry? Right, so if you have real property, that's a, that's something that you can borrow against. But what would be your motivation to borrow against real property? It, maybe you don't even own it. So um, maybe you're looking to acquire property, right? Um, maybe you're looking, you have property and you want to build something on it. Okay, uh, so here's there's acquisition financing, um, and that's you know, the type of transaction that you're probably most familiar with buying a house or buying uh, a building or a hotel or something like that. Refinancing. Um, so a lot of um, property owners uh, that have held property for a while have built up equity given that the price of their property has gone up significantly. And maybe um, they have a willing lender who's willing to let them cash out some of that equity without putting it back into the property in terms of improvements or repairs. And so then they'll borrow a, uh, a real estate owner will borrow in order to finance maybe another acquisition or another project. Um, <clears throat> then construction, which is mostly what I do. So, how any ideas how you would go about financing a real estate transaction uh next row up okay next person over i was going to say i think there's a number of ways to do it but you could always um in terms of my dad did this you would refinance the mortgage on that or like house that our family lived in and then you can use the money you made from that somehow to buy two investment properties for themselves and then there you go so that is a loan so a loan is one form of real estate financing any ideas what other types of real estate financing you could engage in i'll give you a hint alex davis uh one of the presenters talked about one way to raise money for real estate uh, transaction a joint venture so You've got loans, a sale lease back, which is a disguised loan where you sell your property uh, and then you lease it back. So when you sell the property, that's like getting the loan proceeds and then the lease payments back to the person that you sold it to are like interest payments, right? So that's sort of a synthetic loan, a sale lease back, a joint venture, um, so if you own a property with an LLC or a, a partnership or a corporation, and then maybe you own, you know, hundred percent of that, you could sell maybe 50% or 80% or 90% to a capital provider, uh, which is a joint, you know, which you then create a joint venture in your LLC agreement. And you have all those rights that Alex Davis talked about that you have to argue about and figure out solutions to. Preferred equity is a form of joint venture agreement um, where the, the main difference between preferred equity and a joint venture 
is in preferred equity, the uh, preferred equity provider will have a take. So typically the developer manages the day-to-day -day operations of the joint venture and thus the property. But with preferred equity, if the investor, there's a default under the joint venture, the preferred equity provider will take over that day-to-day -day management and they will essentially kick out um, the developer and the developer will have essentially no decision-making other than bankruptcy and winding up typically. Um, and then ground lease, that's another way to finance. Uh, so ground lease is a, like a 99 year lease where um, you, similar to a sale lease back, if, if you own the property, you could lease it um, uh, to a ground lease uh, tenant who then develops the property, you would get those rent payments on your ground. Um, so what are the rights of the lender in the property? Um, any ideas what your what rights your lender, say you're talking about a loan, uh, what would the lender do to your property? Yeah, if it was like a bank, they have the right to foreclose. That's right. And what's the instrument that allows them to foreclose? What do they record against your property? A lien, and what's that lien instrument typically called? Any idea? Okay. You ever heard of a mortgage? Mortgage? Yeah, that's what they record. In California, the form of the mortgage is called a deed of trust, but it's always either called a mortgage or a deed of trust. So, uh, so for a loan, the collateral is the property and the lender will record a deed of trust or a mortgage. The sale leased back, the property sold to the lender and then uh, leased back. Joint venture, um, you'll have economic rights, kickout rights, buyout rights. Alex covered those. Preferred equity, you'll have economic and control rights, kickout and buyout, and pledge of equity interest for hard preferred equity. So there's preferred equity that's often referred to as disguised mezzanine lending. Is anybody familiar with mezzanine lending? Okay. So you could have a loan on, say, you own a hotel. So, okay. You've got a loan with the bank, but you want to borrow more money, but the bank doesn't want more money because you've run up against their loan to value thresholds. So oftentimes money center banks won't lend money beyond like 70% loan to value. Okay, but you want to borrow another 10%. You want to get the 80% loan to value. You want to pull more money out of your property. You could get a mezzanine loan and typically they're provided by hedge funds and private equity who are investing on behalf of say the endowment for a university or a public teacher's uh, retirement fund or a police retirement fund. Or, so th that's the money that is in hedge funds and private equity foreign sovereign wealth funds. Um, and they are typically the shops that provide mezzanine fund uh, financing. And so mezzanine financing would be, you wanna borrow the extra 10% of the value of your property and they will take a security. If it's structured as hard preferred equity, they'll take a pledge of your equity interest in the, pro in the ownership entity that owns the property. So basically they could kick you out of the transaction entirely and you would have nothing. So that's the main difference between hard preferred equity and a normal joint venture is in a normal joint venture, if you mess up as the developer, you're still in it for the economics, but you no longer have decision-making rights. If, you're, if you've got a preferred equity provider that has a pledge, they have the ability to foreclose the pledge and kick you out entirely. You have nothing. Um, and foreclosing on a pledge is very quick. It's not necessarily easy, but it's much quicker than foreclosing on a property, right? So... Um, so it's a very powerful uh, remedy. Uh, and then ground lease, the collateral is the reversion rate. So if you ground lease your property to somebody, it comes back to you after 99 years of collecting rent. Uh, and if this person doesn't pay rent, then the ground lease terminates and you've got, uh, you can ground lease the end to somebody else who can pay. So any ideas, what kind of documents you would see? We've mentioned a mortgage or a deed of trust in a loan. 
Any ideas what kind of documents you expect to see uh, in a financing transaction? What's like the one thing, one document where it's like, I owe you this amount of money. I'm going to pay it monthly on this date. This is the interest that I'm getting charged. Any idea what that document is called? It's the most important document in, in any financing transaction. A promissory note. So, uh, <clears throat> but anyways, before we get to the actual documents, these are uh, some documents would be the fourth uh, bullet point down. You're gonna have a term sheet for your financing transaction. You're going to have a diligence checklist uh, that will be your guidepost as to what the lender needs in order to give you money. You'll have a diligence period where the lender will be uh, going through title survey, zoning analysis, uh, your tax returns, your financial statements for your guarantor and your property. And then you'll have closing documents, which uh, will be all your loan documents, your, your escrow documents, um, and uh, anything that you need to report. Uh, any idea, has anybody, raise your hand if you've seen a term sheet for a financing, uh, commercial real estate finance. Okay, all right. So you have no idea what goes into finance term sheet. So I'll just advance the slide. So the amount of the financing, the term, how long the money's out there for. So typical loans are three, five, or 10 years in commercial real estate at the, and they're usually interest only. So you're only paying interest, but then at the end of that three, five, or 10 years, you owe the entire amount. So right now I have a $300 million loan that I'm documenting and a $900 million loan that I'm documenting two of the about six transactions I'm doing right now. And so on the $900 million one, the borrower is going to pay interest every month. And at the end of four years, this was the construction financing, which have kicked out from three years to four years because of the supply chain issues. So at the end of four years, they have to come up with $900 million to pay my client. Okay. How do you think that's called a balloon payment? How do you think this borrower is going to come up with that money. They're going to lease out the property and then save every penny that's coming in? No, that's not how it works. They're going to refinance and hopefully once they've built the project, it's worth more than 900 million. It's worth significantly more than 900 million. And then they will be able to refinance my client out of the property uh, with another bank. Okay, so that's amount, term, extensions. Um, there will be a number of hurdles that you have to um, uh, go over, but a borrower is typically entitled to one or two one-year extensions in a commercial real estate loan, uh, meaning like you get to the end of your three years, five years, 10 years term. If you can't, like it's a tough market and your like your property is doing okay, you'll be able to extend the term so that you get it to a better market for refinancing the property. Um, fees, the lenders take a lot of fees. It's astonishing how many fees they take. Uh, interest and uh, how interest is calculated. It used to be off the LIBOR, but everybody has moved to SOFR. Anybody familiar with what SOFR is? So it's a federal reserve, FR is federal reserve. And um, SO, I forget what it stands for, but the federal reserve has replaced uh, LIBOR, which was the London Interbank offering rate, uh, because a few years ago, uh, it came out that uh, the three or four of the banks that were involved in determining LIBOR were rigging the LIBOR rates. So uh, everybody's moved over to SOFR now, and that's that's the standard for interest. Will you typically in a commercial real estate loan will be calculated based on SOFR plus a spread. And so, so for right now is close to zero. It's moved up with the interest rate height. So it's more like 0.25. And then you'll have a spread, say 3%. So then you're all in interest is the sober rate, 0.25 plus your spread of 3%. So 3.25% in that example. You'll have diligence requirements, like what the lender needs to see in order to close. You'll have confidentiality so that you as the borrower, if you're the borrower, you're gonna be sending a whole bunch of documents over to the lender 
you might not end up, end up closing with that lender or that preferred equity provider. So you'll want them to keep everything that you disclose confidential. You'll have uh, the term sheet will either be binding or non-binding. You'll have a deposit. You'll have to put up um, you know, X amount of dollars for the lender to start doing their diligence. And then you'll have a breakup fee. And um, if you're in the prefer the private equity and the hedge fund sphere, you'll see higher breakup fees than in the bank sphere. So you really get tied up if you have a high breakup fee and, and that's how um, you get kind of sucked into a deal with no way out. Um, what goes in a checklist? It constitutes diligence for a real estate finance transaction. Well, we've talked about a lot today. Any idea what you want in diligence if you were about to lend money on a property? What's one thing that we talked about that came up in almost every presentation it was title, right? You want to pull title. So you want to pull all the documents that are recorded against the property that you're going to lend money against. You want to get a survey. A survey is a, de a depiction of the property that's done in accordance with ALTA standards. ALTA is the, um, the national survey standards. Um, and then you want the survey to depict all of the different um, easements and title exceptions and what areas of the property they affect. And if you're doing construction financing, you want an outline of the building that's going to be built according to the plans. Because the borrower, when they, they go to get construction financing, will oftentimes already have plans. And so it's much easier to evaluate whether you're going to have encroachments on easements. That means that the, the building is built over an easement or a utility line or, or something like that if you have the surveyor plot where the building's going to be. So you've got documents, your loan documents, your preferred equity documents, your joint venture documents. You've got title, survey, and zoning, an organizational chart. So if you're a borrower and you own property, say you're going to be a real estate investor, even if you're going to do residential, you're not going to own that property in your name. You're going to form an LLC, typically. Uh, Delaware, California-based LLC. And you might have another LLC that owns that LLC. And then ultimately, the individuals or the trust um, that owns the LLC interest. Um, and so you'll have to produce an organizational chart for your uh, lender. And you'll have to produce certificates of formation and good standing for all of the entities on the organizational chart and the LLC agreements or the operating agreements or the general partnership agreements for them. You have to get legal opinions that your document, that the loan documents are enforceable and that they've been authorized. Yeah, you'll get property reports like a property condition assessment and an environmental report, which is called a phase one. And uh, you'll get property, you'll get property level contracts or the lender will request property level contracts like security, uh, landscaping, construction financing, if it's a construction, uh, construction fencing, if it's a construction property, the uh, property management agreements, leasing agreements, there's you know, if you're doing construction, you also have engineers, architect, and general contractor. Uh, you'll have closing documents, uh, which are like escrow instructions to the escrow company. You'll have, uh, you'll have to produce financial information for the lender, uh, tax returns. The lender will do searches on all of your entities and you as an individual. And there are these search companies that will look up judgments, bankruptcies, uh, and, you know, uh, records in terms of incarceration, and there will be background checks on all the individuals involved. Um, do you have a question? No, yeah. No, I don't. No, no, no. Okay. What are your finance documents? Well, we talked about one, the promissory note. So on a loan, the promissory note uh, is the most important document. You'll always want to have an original that. That's one where you never close a transaction on a PDF or a a donkey side. You get the original side note. You'll have a typically a loan agreement, a deed of trust or mortgage, which secures the property, a carve out guarantee. Yes. Sorry, why is it you don't want to do a donkey sign? Uh, well, oftentimes in many states you have kind of antiquated laws where in order to foreclose, you'll have to present the original note. And so at a foreclosure sale, it might be that the court will not accept uh, 
anything other than an original ink signed note. Um, and so you don't have the, uh, uh, nobody is comfortable at this point that you can foreclose on just a copy of the promissory note. You always want to have that note in case when you go to foreclose as the lender, uh, the court asks you to produce the note. Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, a carve out guarantee. Uh, so most commercial real estate lending is non-recourse, meaning they can't sue the uh, they can't sue you as an individual who owns the entity, who owns the entity, who owns the property that they've lent money against. But they've got recourse against you as a guarantor for certain bad acts, and it, they don't even necessarily have to be bad acts. Sometimes it's just sort of a balance of well, the lender shouldn't be liable for. Uh, this. So some things that are typical in a carve-out, recourse carve-out guarantee are fraud. If uh, you were the borrower, that's fraud. Um, absconding with money. So if you use money for purposes other than uh, what you're authorized to do in the loan documents. Um, bankruptcy, you file bankruptcy, then uh, they could sue you for the entire amount of the loan and take the property. Uh, so that's, uh, and then there will often be financial requirements for a carve-out guarantor. Uh, in construction, there's a completion guarantee. So you're obligated to complete the property if you default on the loan, or you as the guarantor. Uh, then there's assignments of all the property documents and an environmental indemnity if there an environmental situation arises. Uh, joint venture documents are typically the joint venture agreement, guarantees, like a recourse carve-out guarantee, but it's really just called the bad boy guarantee for a joint venture, an environmental indemnity, and then uh, sometimes in preferred equity, you'll take a pledge. Uh, sale lease back has a purchase and sale agreement, a triple net lease, which uh, Trisha covered, which is a lease where the tenant pays all the costs of owning the property, all the utilities, uh, basically every cost for the property. Um, a memo of lease, because you want to record that the, that the lease is of record, uh, that there's a lease on the property, a long-term lease. And then uh, if you have a ground lease you want, uh, that would be uh, another document. So how do you close a real estate financing? So um, never smoothly. Like you could have the most easy borrower and lender, most straightforward deal, but the closing is always mm, at least moderately stressful. Um, but if you know what you're doing, uh, it doesn't get out of control or delayed. So you'll have an escrow company um, and that's, that's a pretty stressful job because the escrow company is producing the source and uses or settlement statement. And the source and uses or settlement statement is uh, basically a one to three page document that shows where all the money in the transaction is going. So it could be acquisition costs, you'll have search costs, you'll have attorney's costs, you'll have lender fees, you'll have, um, you might be paying part of the taxes out of the closing, the property taxes. Uh, there's all kinds of fees that go on in these settlement statements and source of uses. And then at the end, it's the money going back to the borrower. You'll have to sign an enormous number of documents. And you might have to notarize some of those documents. Anybody familiar with notarization? Okay, so you have a notary that, so for anything that gets reported, it needs to be notarized. So, um, and then sometimes if you're not confident, um, say you have a guarantor that's named uh, John Smith, right? Uh, you might want to get that guarantor's signature notarized. Uh, because it's such a common name, right? And a, and a guarantee is such an important document. Um, and then recording, you know, uh, the title company and the escrow company are usually one and the same, and they will coordinate recording once everybody authorizes closing of the transaction. Um, so that's it. Uh, anybody have any questions? If not, here's the QR code. You use your... I think it's self-explanatory. Use your camera to scan the QR code, complete the online questionnaire. Yes, that uh, question in the back. Yeah, I think we'll see that close. Let's say you have 
uh, you can do that. That's absolutely a strategy that people use. Uh, it, once you borrow the money, so I guess the, the bank is willing to lend you, say you've got a property in Utah, you've got a property in California. You want to borrow money on the, that's secured by the Utah property. Once that money hits your bank account, that's your money, right? And there may be, you need to make sure that the terms of your loan allow for that money to be distributed to you and for you to use it for other investments. If, that, if you've negotiated that in your loan agreement, then you're going to take that, that money is good in, to use in your cal to acquire a California property or to develop a California property. So it uh, what was the uh, what was the first part of the question? That typically doesn't become an issue. Typically doesn't become an issue. No, crossing state lines is not uh, doesn't create an issue there. Um, any other questions? Yes. So I have a good amount of questions. I'd like right now to go. Okay. Um, first of all, before any of that, um, is it supposed to be that the questions on this are kind of blank? You have to tell that's just one, two, three, just Yeah. I think that's yeah. it. No, no, that's what I have to. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. You just have to list the top three takeaways. Okay, sure. Um, then I wanted to ask about uh, specific units. So you okay. kind of went into it a little bit, but can you give us like the like textbook definition of these? And can you also explain us? How that happens, and also I had a question hypothetically: if the neighbor has an easement for your property and they sell their house, does yeah. that easement transfer to the buyer? Easements typically run with the land. Okay, so an easement is an interest in land, and it's enforceable um, only if it's signed by the party against whom enforcement is sought. So if you have an easement over my land. Right, you go to enforce it and say, I'm using this land. If I have an easement over it, it, it it's usually an agreement to use land uh, for one purpose or another, whether it's access or to um, go on the land and, and uh, use a basketball court for, or something like that. So uh, if you want to enforce your easement, I have to have signed that easement, okay? But say I'm dead, I signed the easement, you recorded it and you said, and in the easement document itself, it says that this easement runs with the land and to the successors and assigns of both the burden and the benefited parcel. Then it doesn't matter that I'm dead. You could go and enforce it over the current owner of the property that I had, right? You could enforce your easement because you have a document of record that says that the easement runs with the land and uh, is enforceable uh, against successors and assigns. And so that's what I stepped into with my house, right? I have this square property, um, but there's an easement recorded against it. Um, the original owner of my house signed it. It was recorded. It says it, uh, it runs with successors and assigns. It runs with the land. Now, there's an interesting question. Uh, there's a legal concept called the rule against perpetuities that you cover in property class in in uh, law school. It's different in every state at this point, and uh, a lot of states have altered, you know, at, at what point a restriction on property that's recorded can no longer be enforceable. But uh, essentially, in, in almost any scenario, that easement is going to be enforceable. So it's an interest in land, essentially, is what an easement is. But in order for it to, if you, you can't just like, you could not create an easement over Loyola Marymount and then sign it and record it and say, I get to use this. You got to remove all these buildings, right? Because I have an easement, right? Because what's the problem with that? Loyola Marymount would be the party that you'd be seeking enforcement against. And if they didn't sign it, you don't have a valid, you can't enforce that. That's why people can don't just report easements against, you know, willy nilly against yeah, properties that they want to take. Yes. Yeah. They're not so clear. It's kind of like my property goes in that that block and things move. So how can they enforce that if you have to? So this 
that way, so I might not be so good at to actually do something. So it's for me on 17 or whatever. Um, that's where title insurance comes into play. Um, oftentimes with older property interests, uh, the title company that, um, you know, the title company will investigate whether they're still in use. And if there's an obvious, like, okay, it was from the 1700s, but this person who owns the farm next door is still coming over here and, you know, uh, letting their cows graze. Um, you won't be able to get property insurance against, and even if you can't read it and you can kind of basically make out what it is, um, you probably are taking subject to that property right. Uh, but for older interested land, older uh, documents that are recorded against the property, oftentimes the title company, if it's not clearly not in use anymore, will be willing to give you title insurance over it and say, if somebody ever tries to enforce this, then you can sue us. That that that's your comfort is that you can sue the title company. Uh, it's like insurance. Um, uh, they will deny coverage every time, and then you have to fight them unless you have a good relationship and you you send a lot of business to the title company. That's just the way it works. But. But at the same token, there is some comfort because title insurance companies don't just insure things. You know, they will underwrite the property, they will investigate. And so you have the comfort of the title insurance company underwrote the title policy and was willing to give you the insurance. So you have some comfort that what they're saying is, uh, is going to be the case, right? But you are taking some risk when you have those uh, older properties with a lot of old documents recorded against them. I have one more. Okay. Um, it's not super relevant to everything you talked about, but if you know, if you know, it's fine. Where can I go to learn how to file my own LLC? Um, so, I, I mean, I'm sure there's uh, tutorials online. I, I essentially, um, there are services that will file your certificate of formation for you if you're forming a Delaware limited liability company. Uh, CSC is one of them. We use Telos out here because uh, a partner that I used to work with, uh, their uh, husband formed this company and they do searches and they do formation documents. So you can just contact a the service. They will, uh, you'll fill out a form. This, this, this formation document, they can email you the form to fill out and then they'll form the LLC for you for a fee. Uh, I think it's around, like it's $500 or less. And then if you're, uh, then the governing document for your, uh, your LLC will be an LLC agreement and you can create whatever kind of LLC agreement that you want within the parameters of the LLC law in the state that you're forming your entity. So Delaware LLC will be subject to Delaware LLC law. And so you'll be, you know, one, uh, at, you know, you can find forms online, but you'll want somebody who's formed and who's uh, created a, a limited liability company group before and has a legal background is a lawyer to actually create the limited liability company for your employer. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, we'll see you in the fall if you decide to take this one again.